Yeah, and welcome everyone uh, to the July uh, community call. Um, the agenda today uh, includes the usual uh, standing agenda items, uh, an update on the development activities going on in and around the foundation, uh, an update on the upcoming events uh, and some of the recently completed events like the I2B2 symposium. And then uh, today's presentation from the community is on the GWASP Plink integration uh, functionality that Thomson Reuters is currently building. Um, as I mentioned, Yanni Pandas from TR will be uh, discussing that, uh, that GWASP Plink integration for us. Um, sorry, I scanned ahead too far. Um, so I'll get right into the uh, development update with a quick update on the Transmart 17.1 project, aka Transmart Pro. Um, again, this is the, um, uh, the Transmart Pro Alliance is uh, the, the heart of this project. Um, and we are currently working on the uh, refinement of the requirements. So uh, from the initial high level requirements that were laid out in the statement of work, we're trying to get down to a set of actionable requirements and their acceptance criteria as a basis for the next step in the project which will be to uh, come up with designs for each of these, uh, these modules. And again, there are three primary modules. There's one to enhance support for cross-study uh, analyses and ontology uh, support. Uh, module B, the longitudinal and electronic health record data support that requires uh, a lot of changes to the back end. And then module C is the integration of a genomics back end and specifically the Arvados uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, so we're working through those requirements with a view to getting the, um, the actual requirements down and so that we can then take the next step with the developers and work on a design. And trying to keep those two separate is sometimes a challenge, but we're, we're doing the best we can. Um, as things stand right now, we hope to have the requirements uh, enumerated at, along with their acceptance criteria by roughly the end of the month after which we'll start the design phase, which will proceed mostly through the month of August. After that, things will go quiet a bit while the um, developers at the Hive actually start some of the engineering work. Um, so it's, it's early days yet. Um, we do have some challenges here, um, and the biggest one is that partly due to the nature of the changes to the back end that are being proposed, um, there are going to be compatibility issues with the existing UI. Um, and so we have to work out exactly how we're going to make that transition uh, from a 16.x release to a 17.1 uh, release. Um, the current project, as we're working on it, is really focused on the back end. It's really focused on creating a stable core with a, a well-documented set of APIs that perform well and are uh, easy to develop against. Um, one of the strategies for maintaining some level of compatibility will be to keep both APIs uh, running for some period of time, um, and that will that will allow people to continue to use uh, a 16 point X installation. Um, but we do need to uh, make adjustments to user interfaces and that sort of thing to really exploit the new functionalities that are going to be added as part of the 17.1 project. Um, there's a, a couple of uh, possibilities uh, that we have available to us, um, but we need to work on sorting out those details exactly which parts of the systems are, are going to break, which ones won't break, and, uh, and then look at the, uh, the options that are in front of us. So among those options is a project that the Hive is also involved in called Translocation, um, which is, uh, among other things, doing some work with a new user interface model. Uh, it, would, it would dovetail nicely with the 17.1 backend changes if, uh, if those can be made to come together at the right time. So that's one possibility. Um, 
we do eventually want SmartR to work uh, against the 17.1 backend as well. Um, and we also have some potential additional partners that have uh, expressed an interest in uh, contributing to the overall project. Um, and uh, if, we can, if we can get those partners uh, engaged at the right time when the APIs are solid enough and, and we know what we're working with, um, then there are opportunities there as well. Um, so for the moment, we are really trying to stay focused on the requirements and the design for the modifications that we really need to make to the core regardless of what else we do. Um, and then uh, we're going to continue to work on the release management strategy. So essentially, how do we get this core integrated into a product that people can, can actually use? Um, so that's one of the challenges we're, we're working on, uh, but we, like I say, we want to stay focused on these requirements that are certainly a necessary uh, first step uh, and, and necessary to underpin any sort of uh, release that we produce for 17.1. Um, so at the same time that's going on, we also have the 16.2 efforts that are going on. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Rudy. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Wow. Um, so 16.2, we have formed our PMC. This is a project management committee, which will uh, oversee uh, the process. Um, we have a process now uh, that we use for 16.1. We are fine tuning that a bit and uh, really trying to follow it um, both to get um, better predictability of our releases to improve, continuing to prove the, the quality uh, of both the release itself and, and the future, the, our ability to be able to maintain uh, the software in the future. And so these are the, this is the team that's um, been asked to, to help us uh, serve to, to pull this together. Um, next slide. The um, proposed features um, for 16.2 are these. Um, there's no guarantee that these will all make it in, but these are all candidates to, to come in, and uh, they all are at a, a fairly you know advanced uh, stage of completion. Smart R is, is essentially done, uh, and they go down from that. But um, the hope is, and we're, we're going to be trying to get all of these uh, into the release if we can, and we'll be working through these in detail. Uh, over the coming weeks. Um, next slide. I thought I'd just touch a, really briefly on uh, you know what our process is and what we're looking for. Um, when someone is contributing a feature, uh, we, we've laid out now a set of requirements that we're, we're asking the contributor to be responsible for. Uh, that includes you know a description of the enhancement, the actual code itself, uh, and the, the the merging of that code into a, a community branch, an integration branch. Of, the, of our code base, um, and then provide documentation on database changes, any impacts to other parts of the system, uh, test uh, unit and functional tests, including test data, uh, installation documentation, documentation of the feature itself, uh, and then ongoing defect review and repair post even past the release. And the hope is that, you know, not only does this give us uh, a good solid base to, to release the particular functionality, but also give us documentation that we need uh, and, and some support for uh, as we, we make, you know, next versions of the, of the, the platform that we can maintain these, you know, these, these contributed tools. Uh, and so we're, we're trying hard to follow this, this process. Uh, next slide. Uh, a very fast glimpse at the development process. We are, you know, uh, maintaining what are essentially three, you know, sets of repositories uh, at the top here is actually the, the release formal official um, uh, source branch, you know, of the of the Transmart um, a foundation software. Uh, the middle one is kind of the the alpha beta stream where the we're actually integrating all the different pieces that are coming together, and then the bottom one is the sandboxes for each particular project. Um, next slide. So the the bottom, you know, starting the, and, and software goes from the bottom up to the top. The bottom is where the features are actually developed, and so each one has their own GitHub uh, set of projects uh, that mimics the the, the foundation's um, official releases. But this is their own individual place to actually do the development. Next slide. Um, and then you know each of the um, features will have their own little sandbox that they're working on. 
uh, in developing. Um, next slide. These, when they're ready, and uh, we're doing this one by one, um, is to move these features into what we're calling the community repository. This is a, a, um, a copy of the official release that's above, but this is a place where the first time the you know, each of these features get integrated into you know, what will become first the alpha branch and then the beta branch of the, the software. Um, this uh, has just been put together for the 16.2 and um, Terry Weymouth uh, has this all pulled together now, and uh, it is uh, getting, getting released uh, one by one to the different teams to, to merge their code in. Uh, and so I know Ward is, is putting in some changes that, um, that have come from, uh, that the Hive has done, and some changes in 16.1 after the release. Uh, and then shortly, the Smart R guys will, will bring their uh, tool into, their pieces into this repository. Uh, this will, you know, this gets tested. It gets run through a lot of automated testing, a lot of actual testing uh, from the internal teams. And then once everybody's happy and we get all the pieces together, this then will become uh, the the beta uh, version of the software that will then open up to a community beta, uh, hopefully in a few weeks. Next slide. And then at the, you know, as we we get, you know, comfortable that we think we have the actual release uh, candidate. These then get moved into the official uh, Transmart platform master, uh, and these re these commits, you know, these things get uh, put in under very careful uh, conditions and uh, you know and, and get uh, reviewed code and things as they move into this this release, and then that will become then the the official release once we get to that point. Um, one more slide. And so the, the process is, you know, these things start at the bottom from the, the, the teams from each of the different projects. They move into this integration branch, the community repository, which becomes the, the place where we, we actually get all the integration together and the initial testing, and then eventually end up in the official release. And we're, we're trying really hard to follow this process so that we get a good high quality release uh, and we get this together. The, the goal for 16.2 is to, to get this out um, by the end of September. And we're hoping that when we show up at the, uh, the annual meeting in, uh, in San Diego, we will be showing you the released version of 16.2 with at least most or if not all of the features um, that I, I laid out there. So that's what I want to say about 16.2. Um, next slide. I'm going to change hats from development and move over to, to marketing. Uh, next slide. A uh, couple of events that um, we want to talk about quickly. The uh, I2B2 symposium at Harvard uh, took place, was a really, uh, I think, very successful meeting. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we are still trying to organize the data thon uh, and then the annual meeting. So I'll talk about these three quickly. Next slide. Um, the I2B2 symposium um, was an all day event, followed uh, two earlier days uh, that Harvard Medical School team put together, which were, were very interesting. And uh, their their uh, presentations are available online and on their site, uh, and we have on our site all the, the talks, the, all the decks from all the talks, and most of the recordings. Uh, we, I lost a couple, unfortunately, for technical reasons. Um, but um, we started the day with uh, an overview of Transmart, uh, and then uh, reflections by by Zach Cahone and and Brian Athey on I2B2 and um, the Transmart. Both with respect to you know a little bit about kind of where they came from, but really uh, a sort of a survey of the kinds of things that people were using these tools for, uh, and some some reflection on you know how these might be brought together, and then uh, some some very interesting uh, presentations um, uh, as the day went on uh, from different teams from around the world uh, talking about how they're using you know I two B two how they're using Transmart and especially showing a few places where they're actually used together. And I just want to call one one particular um, talk, which is one by Paul Viak. Uh, we've all seen Paul talk, and and he's done you know he does a, a great job to really uh, uh, evangelize you know the use of these two systems together. But um, next slide, what he showed was was really I was really very impressed, and it's something that you know you may want to take a look at is that he's worked with the CDC and the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a collection of 41,000 patients. Um, uh, 2,000 different uh, variables, uh, and he's loaded this into a public uh, system that uh, you could log into and, and try out, and I put the link there. Uh, so literally, you, you go to this link, next slide, uh, you put in the um, 
the, uh, the, the password and, and account, which is demo demo. Uh, although we went through a, a very detailed description of a very a sophisticated security model that these, that they are using, but uh, interesting that, but you can get into this next slide and, and you're literally into, you know, what feels like a Transmart instance with all this data, you know, loaded 41,000 patients and, uh, you can start to use the, the power of, you know, the Transmart um, um, UI and uh, play with the data and look at it. So if you'd like to, to take a look at this and the data itself is loaded into I2B2, but um, at the same time, you can you can look at it and do all the analysis that you'd like with um, with Transmart. So uh, if you're if you have any interest in this, uh, you, it's really an interesting um uh, a tool and you can see Paul's presentation on it on the on our website and also go and try it out for yourself so it was a, it was a great day and, and we're pursuing now you know how we best um, move ahead on getting you know integration you know continuing in integration between i2b2 and uh, and Trendmark. okay next slide um, still not a lot to report on the datathon we're still you know in, in the early stages of, of trying to develop this uh, the goal is still to have it, you know, we'll have it at Imperial College um, late summer before the annual meeting. Uh, and then, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have more information hopefully coming soon about that. Next slide. We are now, you know, certainly marketing team is changing its focus now to look at the annual meeting. It's going to take place at the UC San Diego, the very lovely facility in Atkinson's Hall, October 25th to the 27th. Uh, we've got a lot of information now starting to come together on the on our website. I encourage you to go and take a look at it. Uh, next slide. We've got a number of uh, interesting keynotes uh, lined up, uh, both um, you know some of the, the local UC San Diego uh, folks talking about you know first of all you know some of the the data analysis tools and um, Larry Smar is going to give us a, a, a description of work he's doing on longitudinal longitudinal biomarkers and microbiome analysis, ending with uh, uh, showing us his data wall. As we as we leave the auditorium, we'll walk through his data wall and actually see you know, the kind of information that he's got um, you know, up there on the, you know, the, that you can look at on there. And a number of other, you know, folks, you know, you know that are ranging from, you know, uh, data, you know, uh, semantics of, of, you know, putting together data and, and provenance of metadata tools, um, some disease areas and, and how, you know, they're working to pull together information and, and data across diseases. Uh, and, you know, to, uh, you know, Cleanthus who will talk about, you know, kind of the, the state of bio, uh, biotechnology in San Diego for a dinner time speaker. So a lot of interesting guys here who will be giving some very nice talks for us. Next slide, um, we're, we're changing a little bit the format. It's mostly going to follow the way it has uh, previous years. We'll have two tracks running, but rather than having science and technical, which we struggle to, to squeeze you know, the, the topics into these, we're just going to have uh, independent tracks. There's going to be about eight or nine of these sessions. Uh, each session will have three or four speakers on a particular topic and end with a 30-minute panel discussion. And we're, you know, here's some of the, the ideas that we have. We've, we've had a couple of these um, uh, proposed by different groups and um, you know what we're looking for are people interested in these topics and we're looking for session leaders and speakers within you know the various topics and we'll be making uh, with the organizing committee uh, the, the final decisions on which topics we're going to actually um, go with oops going ahead there back yeah there we go registration is going to open shortly um go ahead, next slide we are working on hotels that we can uh, offer um, and we're trying to get some good rates. Um, and then we'll have uh, the usual, you know, the, the two different tracks. We'll have a reception on the first evening and then a dinner the second evening. Uh, breakfast and lunch will be provided each day. Uh, and something new this year, and, and you know, we're, we're not happy about this, but, you know, we, we need to put a fee in place this year. Um, we're trying to keep it as low as we could. Uh, and so uh, the structure is there, you know, $4.99 for industry and $150 for Academics, government, and nonprofits. Uh, members can attend for free, so it's a benefit of being a member of the foundation. Uh, and we are offering an early bird discount uh, if you register by September 10th. So we'll have all this up on the registration site um, within um, the next day or two, and uh, you'll be able to start registering for the event and hopefully take advantage of our early bird discount. Um, next slide. Finally, I just want to give a little commercial. We have our training program going this year. We've had a lot of uh, attendance uh, and it's, it's been going 
quite well. We've got a lot of topics this year instead of just having um, intro course. And so uh, we've done six classes already. Uh, we're, we're ahead of last year in terms of number of people that are training. Uh, and uh, we have a basics class coming next week. Uh, and then, you know, as the rest of the year unfolds, you know, we have continuing a number of beginners classes, but also a class on the um, uh, data science and Transmart API by the Hive and Rancho will be given an advanced workflows session in October. Uh, and so these are all, you know, interesting classes that hopefully you'll, you'll consider. So that's what I have to say. And um, I think, uh, Keith, you want to take it over and introduce Yanni? Or I can just introduce him. Sure. Thanks, Rudy. Um, Yanni, let me just find you here and go ahead and unmute you. Okay. And what I'm going to do, Yanni, is um, use your slides as you sent them to me, uh, because when I tried to merge them with ours, it lost the TR logo, and I thought that was not a very good Thanks. So, um, so Yanni, can you hear? Yes, I can. Great. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Good, good. So if you want to just let me know when to advance the slides, I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Rudy. So um, I'm just going to be going through the uh, feature candidate for Transmot 16.2 that was mentioned in the previous slides. So I'm going to uh, describe to you what we've done so far in a collaboration with the University of Liverpool on, in, on enabling full link uh, data support and analysis uh, within Transmot. So uh, next slide, please. And just a, a quick mention to the, the development team. Um, so I would just like to, to point out um, my colleague um, Stephen, who has uh, essentially designed the project um, which I'm now managing, um, and our ETL engineer Vadim, um, and also um, Sarah Shiraz and Lawrence, who have helped out from the Thomson Reuters side. And from the University of Liverpool, this um, was all possible um, due to the work from Anna Alterovic, who is a senior lecturer in uh, molecular and clinical pharmacology, Eunice Zhang, and, um, and Richard Gregory. Um, next slide, please. Oops, do I have it twice? Yeah, there we go. So uh, what we've what we've done so far, and I've obviously been showing a few screenshots um, of of um, what it looks like in Transmart in the following slides. So what we've um, done, we've enabled, uh, we've um, implemented a new table in the database level, which supports binary data. So we chose that um, specifically to be able to support the bed uh, formats from uh, Plink um, in order to reduce the file size versus the textual um, format. Um, we've also um, provided ATL support, um, and we can load this data uh, using the, our, TM, our ETL tool that we developed, TM Data Loader. And uh, just, just a note for the people that um, already know Plink, um, the BIM files are loaded as essentially as platform annotation files, so it's the equivalent when we load, uh, for example, transcriptomics. Uh, the workflows that um, uh, is enabled, it's enables essentially a de novo GWAS. So um, the the group with, with in Liverpool is essentially a GWAS powerhouse, and they're very good at um, pharmacogenetic analyses. And they would like they wanted to be able to define case controls um, based on their own hypotheses and run analyses rather than to um, you know, directly have somewhere to, to store uh, the GWAS results, which is a wonderful feature that we know that was developed um, and contributed by Pfizer. So, um, we, so we're able, we've enabled a um, def definition of case control using the Analyze um, Comparison tab. Uh, we then allow the user for at least the de novo GWAS to set the p-value threshold that they wish. And, of, and the maximum output rows to display within the browser. Um, we can obviously download the full um, results um, locally. 
Uh, we've, admit, we've allowed uh, the user to define what type of association analysis and what statistics to run, so whether it's um, um, a basic chi-square, a Fisher's exact, or a Fisher's exact with a Lancaster's mid dp adjustment. And um, as I said, the output is the, the Plink association table. Next slide, please. So, um, so as I said, the, in the database, uh, the the data the the table for the binary data has been implemented. The ETL um, part, so, um, the um, the Plink file formats, BED, BIM, and FAM specifically, are supported, um, and the analytical workflows, that, as described uh, uh, before. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what essentially the ETL folder structure looks like. Um, people who are available, who are familiar with our um, ETL tool, the TM Data Loader, will, will see this um, is something familiar. And I also provided a, um, a tutorial um, in the last uh, training sessions, and um, some of our, my colleagues have also done so in the past. This is what essentially the, the, the folder structure looks like um, within the server when before you don't load the data. So you provide the mapping file, you provide the actual clinical data um, shown in the top part, and below you actually provide the different, uh, the mapping file and the, and the test and the bed, BIM, and FAM files. And yeah, I think you, um, one could zoom, zoom in and see the exact data. This is just dummy data we use for tests. Um, next slide, please. So, um, just a few screenshots um, showing exactly how um, you run the uh, once you've loaded the data, what it looks like. So, um, in this case, we've um, just assigned an arbitrary covariate called smoke um, status, for example, smoking status, and you could define the um, your case um, in subset one as. Um, not smoking and the, the and the and the controls as smokers um, in subset two. Essentially, we want to see with the available genetic data is there any um, any specific SNP associated to smoking in this case. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, just just to show you the um, the typical um, summary stats that we all expect from Transmart. Next slide. And here you'll see that when we define and set the analysis parameters, so when we go to the advanced workflow, you'll see down the bottom there's a highlighted um, section called GWAS Plink. That's the it's an analysis that wasn't previously there. So we set that. Next slide. And this the and the dialogue the the parameterization dialogue that uh, appears. You basically can um, choose the type of analysis that you want. And for the linear and logistic regression, I'll mention them um, in a bit. Uh, you then uh, you can give the the analysis a name to be able to, to in the future to re to retrieve that um, the result. You set your p-value threshold here. I've just, as an example, set a 0 0.01 threshold, and you and you also define the maximum number of rows to display within the browser. This is just because um, anyone that's familiar with uh, genetic results, this this table could be quite large depending on the on the results and depending on the p-value. So this is just to make it, to make sure to to define how many to view to, um, on the screen, not. Um, and you can download the full result. The other parameter, the other parameterization, is um, is linked um, mainly to the linear and logistic regression. It's not going to be covered at this point. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is essentially I I, I didn't have this, uh, the the um, the screenshot of it running. Essentially, it runs and uh, invokes Flink in the on the server level, and it runs the analysis. Um, it, it is it is pretty fast based because it's on um, using binary data. So this type of analysis it takes about uh, less than a minute to, to to complete, and you see the typical output that you would expect from uh, from Plink showing the significant SNPs 
uh, the coordinates, the chromosome position, the odds ratio, the, the p-values, all the stats that you need. Next slide, please. So when you scroll down to the bottom of the of the of the page, you see um, this blue hyperlink bar, the download link results. And I've just um, shown a few screenshots of what it looks like. So once you download it, this is what the container and the zip file looks like internally. So it's the typical association and format that Plink provides. And we also um, output it in CSV format for, um, for opening with Excel. And you can see basically that um, it contains the same information displayed on the previous table, but it's the list may be much longer than just 100 or however many um, uh, uh, results the user has defined to see. Next step, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, essentially, on, in a nutshell, that's what I wanted to show you so far, um, uh, what we've what we've been doing, and um, the the additional tasks, what we have completed. So we did some scalability testing. We actually loaded a data set contained from with five, uh, roughly one. 5,800 individuals, so that's more than six million SNPs per individual, um, and uh, it, we could uh, we could load it perfectly, um, and we could also um, analyze it. So we just made sure that we could we could um, address the actual numbers, um, which are uh, usual for these types of analyses. Um, the we have the um, the next workflow, the Lin logistic. Um, um, regression models that were described. These are the, are the bugs, bug fixing stage at the moment, and hence I didn't want to, to show you yet. Um, which essentially you 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 can test um, a quantitative or categorical trait um, for its association with SNPs. So you can go and say, okay, take for example um, blood pressure and find me um, as a continuous variable and tell, tell me which um, SNPs are associated with various degrees of blood pressure. And that's just uh, for an example. So the, and this is um, ultimately finished. We just am um, fixing the final few bugs. Um, we, and for the planned, we, uh, we have planned integration with, uh, with our Metacore uh, tool for advanced functional analyses. Um, we also plan to um, integrate it and the, the workflow with um, the, uh, with the GWAS functionality as provided by Pfizer. Essentially, um, the, um, G, the Pfizer functionality is a perfect store to just take the output that was shown on the previous um, on the previous um, screen and load it into the. GWAS a result storage page, so you can um, recall the results and also take uh, leverage uh, Guava for the visualization of, uh, for example, Manhattan plots with the results. And um, currently unplanned at the moment um, is the um, is the um, Oracle database compatibility because uh, we're we're not we're not at the stage yet, and I know that um, that may potentially impact. The, um, how we integrate with um, how we deliver this feature for 16.2 at least in the short term. Next slide, please. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions. Okay. Um, if anyone has a question, you can either type it in or go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll unmute you. Um, in the meantime, Yanni, I do have one question. Um, you answered my question about Oracle versus Postgres. Um, I was wondering. You mentioned the uh, the table for binary data. Is that specifically designed for bed files, or is that a more generic capability? At this stage, it's designed for bed files. So we we designed it with uh, with a specific request from our um, from our collaborators um, in mind. Okay. But I'm uh, but I'm I'm not sure if it if it could be abstracted and used more generically. That would be a a question that I would have to go back with to the developers with. Okay. Great. Um, one sec. Somebody else has a question here. Uh, oh, here we go. We do have a question from Weibo. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Rebo, I think you can, there you go. 
Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. I was wondering how um, how is the the clinical data that you see in the in the in the tree linked to the the binary data that you upload? Um, the the clinical data. So it's it's linked in the same way uh, that that you. Um, so essentially, we construct um, from the tree that you see. We essentially construct um, take the clinical data. And once once invoking the analysis, we rewrite the the fan file on the fly. So essentially, um, sorry, the yeah, the, that's correct. I think um, if I'm not mistaken. So we write the parameters into the new and then send it to the link to, to do the analysis. Okay. So the the basically the patient or the subject IDs that are in the clinical data are the same in the in the the binary files that you've yeah. uploaded. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> do you have a sense of how difficult an Oracle uh, port will be for this? Has anybody looked at it? Um, I don't have a sense at the moment, but that would be that would be a next um, a next step that we have on our on our um, on the on to do list to see how um, the estimation of of what it would take. I don't suspect it would be it would be too difficult, but um, then again, I'm not a developer, so I can't speak out of turn. Fair enough. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? I think I say you can raise your hand or type into the question box. All right. Um, well, thanks, Yanni. I mean, I think this is, uh, I would think this would be a, a capability of great interest to a lot of people, especially with the integration with the GWAS results uh, infrastructure. Um, makes, makes for a nice round trip um, through the whole database. So. Um, let me just check one more time. Any questions? Um, are there questions about anything else that we've covered today? Uh, not just about the... Uh, Thank you, Migration. Uh, don't see any. Um, all right. Well, uh, then with that, I think uh, we'll wrap this session up a little bit early and give you 15 minutes back. Uh, and thank you again. Um, and uh, like I say, check out the website for more information about the uh, more up-to-date information about the uh, annual meeting especially. And don't forget to check out the training session that's upcoming. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And we will uh, see you next month. Thanks, Keith. Bye.